Infinite Dial 2017, an audiographic novel as a podcast, and more trouble at SoundCloud. Welcome to the Richard Daly Podcast, bringing you a UK perspective on the latest news and developments from the world of podcasting and internet radio. Welcome to episode 27. I'm your host, Richard Daly. Each week I curate and discuss the latest news in podcasting and internet radio with a focus on the smaller podcaster, radio host and DJ. Let's start this week with some controversy in the podcasting world. A new investigation-style podcast in the vein of Serial has gained a huge amount of publicity in recent weeks. Missing Richard Simmons follows the true story of Dan Taberski as he tries to find out what has happened to Richard Simmons. Now, for listeners outside of the US, it's probably worth explaining that Simmons is a bit of a phenomenon in the fitness world. A larger-than-life character, he was, until recently anyway, known as a fitness guru with a popular exercise studio, and he was celebrated for being very generous with his time. Now, for unknown reasons, Simmons suddenly withdrew from the public eye. The podcast is very well produced, it mixes narration and interviews, and encourages the audience to contribute their ideas and thoughts on the reasons Simmons might have gone missing. So what's the problem, you might ask? Well, questions are starting to be asked about how ethical this kind of investigative show is. Nick Qua from Hot Pod says that he loves the show, but is finding it difficult to ignore the moral quandary that looms over its production. Nick asks, what right does a documentary producer have to waive a person's right to privacy? Now, we don't know why Simmons withdrew from the public eye, and that is where much of the concern lies. Does he just want to be left alone? Has something bad happened? We don't know, and there has to be a concern that speculation could make things worse. So you might ask, why do I mention this story? Well, I think there's a lesson here for all podcasters, whatever your topic. It's simply that it's important to think about the impact on others with anything you talk about on your podcast. A final note on the Richard Simmons story, as some observers have pointed out, it's interesting that in the main, the discussion on this controversy is being had in the traditional media and is being less discussed within the podcasting industry, aside from Nick, of course. Cherie Hu has written an article for Forbes.com, Why the Music Industry is Finally Taking Podcasts Seriously. I love Cherie's writing, and she is one busy lady, according to her bio. In this article, she discusses the extent to which the music business is starting to invest in podcasting, and how podcasts are becoming an integral part of the future of the industry. Now, as I mentioned on the last episode, Spotify has just launched their first original music-based podcasts, and Google Play have now also announced their first original podcast called City Soundtracks. City Soundtracks gives listeners a guide around the musical highlights of different cities, with each stop on the tour chaperoned by a local artist. Major labels like Sony Music Entertainment are also experimenting with short-form audio podcasts, which are centred around their back catalogues in the main. The question that Sherry poses in her article is how successful will these companies be in taking the traditional podcasting models and repurposing them for the largely revenue-driven music culture? What these companies and similar ones have is experience in developing advertising and subscription models, as well as the use of tools like metadata and recommendation engines to increase listening time. Now the point of all this is, of course, that the music industry is starting to see a financial link between music and podcasting. I think this is going to lead to rapid innovation in podcast monetization. We will see an acceleration of dynamic ad insertion and further drives towards better metrics. It remains to be seen how well this will really benefit the independent podcaster, of course, but at least it starts to legitimise the use of music in podcasts, which has always been a bit of a challenge. Brief news now of a UK podcast festival. Shout Out Live, the festival, takes place on August the 5th in London and aims to bring the best podcasts out of the US as well as highlighting the best of the UK. They describe it as a full day of banter, commentary and recklessness. Now I don't have a lot of details at this stage I'm afraid, but it looks like a number of US based podcasts will be in attendance and there'll be meet and greet type opportunities. Tickets go on sale April the 3rd. You can follow the organisers on Twitter at So Live Festival. This week saw the release of the results of the latest Infinite Dial survey by Edison Research and Triton Digital. This is an annual survey that explores the use of digital platforms and new media by Americans. It's always eagerly awaited by podcasting commentators, and it always seems to contain one or two surprises. You can check out the whole report on the Edison Research website, and of course I'll put a link in the show notes to the download page. The study is put together through 2,000 interviews with people selected at random. Brad Hill for Rain News noted that one of the most interesting statistics this year was the podcast completion metric. 
The number came as a pleasant surprise to many in that 40% of listeners stick through entire podcast episodes and another 45% listen to most of their shows. Brad writes that this means 85% of podcast listeners hear any pre-roll and mid-roll advertisements, assuming they don't skip through them, of course. For Brad, this one statistic gives the Infinite Dial report all the authority it needs. Because, of course, consumption data is the one statistic advertisers really want. Brad goes on to provide some supporting graphs on listener drop-off from specific networks with data from NPR and 60dB showing how longer episode length encourages drop-off. This is well worth a read on the Rain News blog. I'll put a link in the show notes, richarddaly.com forward slash 27. Let's look at some of the other stats and takeaways from the report that will be of interest to podcasters and online radio DJs and station owners. Both podcasting and online radio continue to see steady growth. As an example of this, the share of Americans who report being monthly podcast listeners is now 24%. That's 67 million people, which is a 14% increase over the previous year. The weekly online radio audience is now 140 million Americans, or 53% of Americans aged 12+. plus. Do realise that this includes platforms like Pandora, that some of us might not really consider to be radio. The average weekly time spent listening to online radio rose from 12 hours and 8 minutes to 14 hours and 39 minutes, a 21% growth year on year. Podcast consumers listen to an average of 5 podcast episodes per week, while the average number of podcasters that listeners subscribe to is 6. In terms of numbers, there are some 8 million people who listen to 6 or more shows each week. 60% of Americans 12 and older have heard of podcasting, which is up from 55% last year. 40% of those surveyed have ever listened to a podcast, up from 36% last year. And 24% have listened in the last month, that's up from 21% last year. Of course, the report contains many more statistics and lots of graphs, so I think I'll let you check out the rest of them for yourself. For an interesting discussion on the podcasting stats in this edition of the Infinite Dial Report, I suggest you listen to episode 161 of the New Media Show podcast, which was published on the 12th of March. The hosts Todd Cochran and Rob Greenlee are joined by Rob Walsh of Lipsyn to discuss the survey results in detail. Rob, as always, knows his stats. Lipsyn has billions of downloads from their hosting platform, and he mentions on the podcast a couple of times that 57.2% of their downloads come from the US. I emailed Rob to ask him if he could tell me what percentage of Libsyn downloads come from the UK, and he very kindly sent me the answer. It's 6.7%. So why are these numbers useful? Well, on the podcast, Rob uses the US figure to estimate the total number of monthly downloads coming from the US. Todd Cochran does a similar rough calculation using the total number of podcasts in iTunes, the number of active shows that Blueberry, his company, hosts, and the number of downloads they get. As you'd expect, Nicholas Qua has done quite an in-depth piece on the report for his Hot Pod newsletter as well. As this episode is already quite full, I think I'll leave discussing the topic that Nick majors on until next week. He has some useful thoughts on the challenges of programming and discovery in podcasts that the report highlights. Though I should say he kind of disproves the often stated issues of discovery and focuses on his own ideas to improve programming. That's for next week. Last thing to say about the report for this week is that Edison Research and Triton Digital have also said they will produce a more extensive podcast report in the next couple of months. Okay, once again, SoundCloud is looking for more money. Apparently, they've been trying for the last few months to raise about $100 million. That's on top of the $70 million investment they received last year from Twitter. I've mentioned before that Google was a potential buyer and Spotify has also been mentioned, but no deal has been done to date. Apparently SoundCloud is now looking to accept a reduced sale price, perhaps as low as $250 million. SoundCloud themselves will only say the company is talking to potential investors and strategic partners. SoundCloud's user base should be interesting to potential buyers. In 2014 they claimed 175 million monthly unique users, though they haven't provided any updated figures since. Most of those users won't be paying anything of course, as on SoundCloud it's mostly the contributors who pay. And many of those DJs and producers have walked away because of the issues of takedowns caused by the copyright algorithms that the platform uses. As a comparison, Spotify has more than 50 million paid subscribers, while Apple Music says it has more than 20 million. SoundCloud has tried to increase revenue by adding a paid subscription model to its free core service, but this doesn't really seem to have worked. They've also just launched a $5 tier, a lower price point than all of the other streaming services. $5 
There are some suggesting that SoundCloud might just shut down with very little notice, potentially leaving some podcasters who host their shows there stranded. I think this is unlikely, but if you do use the platform, either for podcast or music hosting, then you really should make sure you have an offline backup of all your content. Of course, you do that anyway, don't you? I've seen before the pain that can be caused by a SoundCloud account being deleted following copyright disputes, with an online radio station losing years of recorded shows. So don't let it happen to you. Another week, another article saying that podcasting needs better metrics. Naturally, it's all about the perceived needs of advertisers rather than to help the podcaster deliver a better show for his or her listeners. This is from Stephen Goldstein of Amplify Media. At the recent Rain Streaming Audio and Podcasting Advertising Summit in New York, Stephen moderated a session on podcast metrics. Stephen notes that at the summit, Spotify and other streaming audio suppliers talked about the huge amounts of listening data that they can provide to advertisers. They know who is listening, what is being listened to, when it's being listened to, and even the personal habits of individual listeners. Now, Steve makes an interesting point, which is that this level of understanding of the usage is way beyond anything broadcasters in the past have ever had. Now, here I'm talking about television and radio, and let's be honest, they've never done too badly from advertising, have they? During the podcast panel, it seems there was little discussion of using data to profile listeners and fine-tune the content. Stephen puts this down to podcasters being resigned to the lack of data provided by Apple. Yes, I think we'd all like more data. It's just that in the main, we want it for different purposes. Finally, there seem to be plenty of advertisers who are more than happy with their investment in podcast ads. Perhaps it's more the agencies and podcast platforms that are trying to sell advertising that are really driving this discussion on metrics. I've mentioned media strategist Mark Ramsey a few times on this podcast. His podcast with Tom Asacker, Media Unplugged, is one of my personal favourites, and he tends to bring a radio perspective to podcasting topics. Mark has just announced that his company, Mark Ramsey Media, has signed an agreement to develop content for the on-demand audio publisher, Wondery. The first show created under that agreement launched earlier this month. It's called Inside Psycho, and Mark bills it as the first audiographic novel in the podcast space. The show is a six-part deep dive inspired by the making of the classic movie Psycho. The show is heavily produced with clever sound design and a strong sense of drama. This seems designed to make you feel part of the show by immersing the listener right into the story. The show is available on iTunes and other podcast directories, and it's well worth a listen. I'll be honest, it's not quite my cup of tea. I'm not sure whether that's because of the subject matter or the production, but I do recommend you give it a go and try it for yourself. Mark also appeared as a guest on episode 23 of the pod to pod podcast recently, where he shared his experience from years in media and talked about how that could be applied to better podcasting. The interview with Matthew Passy discussed the importance of putting out content that you care about and the importance of finding a niche. Mark says that following both of these ideas will make it more likely that you will produce something unique and interesting, as well as helping you find an audience that is interested in what you are saying. Don't fall victim to vanity casting, says Mark. This is the idea of just making a show for the sake of having a podcast. Finally today, I thought I would look at a really interesting blog article written from the point of view of a radio listener. Nikki O'Hara writes about random things I hear on the radio and discusses how commercial radio shows tend to follow the same structure. Now this is actually from 2015, but still makes interesting reading, especially if you work in radio or are thinking of starting your own online radio station. Nikki works in an office environment where they have a commercial radio station on all day. What she has noticed is that commercial radio tends to follow the same structure, and there are four parts to it. Talk, news, music and adverts. In her blog article, Nikki breaks out the four parts and provides some great insights. Talk. Really listening to the radio takes a lot of concentration, which is why there's not a lot of real talk in commercial radio. The talk that does happen is not opinionated, and there is no discussion about the real happenings of the day. Nikki concludes that talk is just filling space between the news, the music and the adverts. On news, Nikki says commercial radio tends to concentrate on local news, and she never really knows what's going on in the world until she gets home and can catch up properly online using Twitter. Now, of course, it's interesting to note that she says Twitter and not more traditional news sources. With music, Nikki references, perhaps without realising it, the small music playlist that most commercial stations use, when she says that Uptown Funk is the most played tune she can remember in her lifetime. But luckily she's not sick of it. She also jokes about the genre or period features that all commercial stations seem to use, and how they always have catchy titles to promote them, 
Fun time at five. Seventies at seven. Eighties at eight. Finally, adverts. Adverts are a strange one. Like the news, they're generally very local, but probably the same in every region. Nikki's thoughts on adverts, and particularly the voiceover artists used, show that they do make listeners think. But the language used can often be a little strange. I love Nikki's conclusion. And that's it really, on a loop, hour after hour after hour. You can see more of Nikki's writing on her blog at iamtypecast.com. Okay, so that's all the news from the Richard Daly podcast for this week. If you visit my website at richarddaly.com, you will find all of my social media links, as well as the various ways you can subscribe to the show. The show notes for this episode are at richarddaly.com forward slash 27. As usual, please send me your questions or comments. And if there is a topic you'd like me to cover, then you can tweet me. As always, I do really appreciate your feedback. If you're enjoying the podcast, I'd be really delighted if you would leave me a rating and review at iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening and I will see you on the next episode.